if the governor's proposal goes through, uh, the people who do the work day in and day out are facing $6 billion in cuts for this year. Now for San Francisco, that equates to $40 million in cuts. Last year, by the skin of our teeth, we prevented over 500 layoffs of teachers, classroom teachers primarily, uh, through use of the Rainy Day Fund. We hope that a portion of the Rainy Day Fund will come back this year to prevent those layoffs, but that's unclear at this point. And it's unclear that even if we get that same share of the Rainy Day Fund, that that would prevent layoffs, because no one is quite sure how deep the cuts are going to be. On top of the $6 billion in cuts that the governor is proposing this year, he's also proposing a structural change for K through 12. Prop 98 has certain guarantees of funding. And with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's proposal, uh, the figure that, that I've read is that schools would then lose up to $7 billion a year for the foreseeable future, because that would be a structural change. So this governor and this Republican Party is trying to cut the floor out of the schooling, the education, the training that working class, middle class kids need in order to prosper in the future. So there is a crisis facing us. 30% um, of the school districts in this state, 30% are facing insolvency. And that means the state has to take them over but the state takes them over because the local school boards can't balance the budget, what's the state bringing? They have no resources. So local democratic control of the schools will be lost, and state bureaucrats will come in to impose a kind of austerity budget. Now, that's not only gonna be bad to the quality of education, but think of the hard-won labor contracts that teachers and paraprofessionals from the CFT, uh, CTA side and, and think of SEIU people, at least in San Francisco, people represented by other unions. Those hard-won contracts are going to be torn apart. And who knows what the standard of living of the average school worker will be after these cuts go through, if in fact they do go through. So there's plenty of gloom and doom, and, and it's for real, and it's, uh, it, it's a horrific picture, I've been in the district for almost a quarter of a century now, and this is the third or fourth major round of layoffs that the district has faced. This is by far uh, the worst of it all. And I just want to take you through a, what would be a typical day at my school. I'm a classroom teacher at Lowell High School. I've also taught at Balboa and Galileo and Mark Twain continuation, but I've been at Lowell off and on since 91. So what will it mean? Well, the school day starts off around 8, and if you wandered over to Lowell High School, probably the first thing you would see is a bunch of adults hanging out in the sidewalk in front of the school. Most of those adults are, adults are special ed paraprofessionals, classroom aides. And they're standing there waiting for the little yellow buses to arrive to bring the special ed kids. Well, guess what? If the cuts come through, who are the first people to lose their jobs? It's the paraprofessionals. So those great people who make such a minimum modest wage and great work they do will be gone. Who's going to greet the students? But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe there won't be the yellow buses because already the district is talking about eliminating the bus service. So how are the special ed kids going to get to school? Who's going to take care of these kids? There's no one to greet them and perhaps no friendly bus driver, which by the way is another union. Our bus drivers local? No bus drivers to bring them over. So let's leave that little happy scene of social decay and walk into the main entrance and there's the Lowell Library. It's a great place. Lowell kids are motivated. If you know anything about Lowell, those kids, for whatever reason, and God knows what's going on with them, but they're learning, they're studying, they're getting great grades, and they hang out in the library and they do their work by the hundreds. Well, guess who else is going to get cut? The librarians. We're blessed with two librarians and a paraprofessional. We know there'll be cuts in the library services. So maybe the library won't be open before school or after school, or maybe some of the hours during school, or maybe won't get more high-tech material, because the kids 
are learning in ways that I don't understand at this point. I feel fairly archaic. <laughs> They're so far ahead of me and, and, and so many of us adults. So the library's cut back. Let's walk over to the main office. Now, I've been a building rep for many years, and I've had many, many struggles with site administrators. But God knows we need good principals and assistant principals. We need someone to steer the ship, and we could give them a hell when they go in the wrong direction or don't share the decisions with us. But we're going to lose site administrators. So they'll be gone. One of the first things you see in the morning is kids lining up at the counseling office, which is at Lowell just beyond the main office. Who's going to help the kids get into college? Who's going to help the kids when they're having problems at home? They're going to cut counselors. Counselors will be gone. The students won't get the kind of guidance they need. And when teachers are having problems with a student in their classroom or don't know how to reach the classroom, the student or know what's going on, there won't be counselors for the teachers to reach out to. I could go on and on. I know I've only got five minutes. You're on 10 now, boy. I'm on 10. All right. You're doing a so, great job, though. So, the, the last thing, because this is heart to heart, I could talk about science classes doubling in size and how kids won't get one-on-one -on -one help when they're mixed up in, in a lab. I won't tell you about that. And I won't tell you about the 20 to 1 ratio in ninth grade math classes that'll be lost. And now we'll have 40 kids in a math class. And we know the kid who's going to fall behind is the kid who's already struggling. I'm going to tell you about something that hurts teachers to the core. If you walked into my department, the social studies department at Lowell, you would find a mix of old timers like myself and the new bloods who bring new ideas, innovations into teaching, enthusiasm uh, that, that helps those of us been around maybe too long catch a little fire ourselves. And we love seeing new teachers come in. Well, guess who we're going to lose? It's the best and the brightest entering into the school system. Their heads are going to get cut off. They're going to be gone. And the school is going to be a more somber place. So, Lowell High School, and the same thing will happen at Mission High School, and Tom's over there on the side at Lincoln High School. The schools are going to be decimated. And the sad thing is, is that San Francisco, by virtually everyone's acknowledgement, is right now the best urban school district in the state of California, and one of the best in the country. And these damn cuts are going to end that progress. Now, just a couple of minutes on the last two parts of the presentation. I'm sorry, Tim. How have we responded so far? Well, we're having the rally next Tuesday, February 3rd at City Hall, 4.30. Told you about that. Please join us. But a lesson we learned and it, how it impacted us this weekend, as I think is important to note, and I'm sorry for the time. CTA meets four times a year, the great giant of public education. And CTA leadership put before the 600 or so delegates a proposal for CTA to go on the ballot with a 1% sales tax that's simply for K through 12. UESF and the other large urban locals, we formed our own caucus. We fought it on the floor of the convention because we think it's the wrong headed way to go. Sales tax is regressive and only for public schools at a time where health care, transportation, environment, social work, community policing, fire departments are all going to be hurting nursing. We learned a lesson a few years ago when firemen, cops, nurses, and teachers rallied together and brought the public with us to defeat Schwarzenegger's initiatives. That's the lesson we learned, and that's why we carry the fight to the floor. Now we lost by six votes. The CTA leadership, and it's tough to take on the CTA leadership, we lost by six votes over, at over 600 delegates. CTA is wrong. We hope that this minimal victory from the floor is going to stop them in their tracks. Hopefully the labor movement and other progressives will put something better on the ballot and allow our leaders to save face by quietly withdrawing their initiative. The lesson learned is that public sector workers have to stick together and join the broad public with us to fight against these cuts against public education, public health, public transportation, and the well-being of all of us. I am Paolo Marquez with the Associated Students Council. I'm a senator. And um, again, I would like to speak about the budget cuts that uh, we're experiencing right now. This is crisis. This is very devastating to us all, both educators, staff, personnel, and even students. 
Um, first and foremost, this education is uh, very important to our future, whether it be for the students or the adults. And the current budget cuts, which is $4.8 billion, would entail laying off more than 107,000 teachers, which is almost 40% of the state's teaching workforce. Second, it may eliminate four weeks of school year and or increasing class sizes by 35%, making them about one quarter bigger. These data I've gotten from SFGate, um, the San Francisco government website, as well as the California Progress app updates. Um, on my personal experience, uh, first-hand experience with the budget cuts is that, especially last semester, when I tried to enroll in a class, there were about 100 students in the classroom, which is, uh, say, it can take 40 students or up to 50 students, and there are about, say, um, 100 students wanting to add a class. This is a very uh, message that is being sent out to us that we need to act on this immediately, and it has a great impact on how a student learns and how conductive the learning atmosphere would be for students. Furthermore, uh, one of my experiences is that adding a political science class, we only have one uh, political science two and three sections in the City College of San Francisco. And I tried to consult uh, some of the administrators and unfortunately it's hard, but we cannot add any more sections due to this budget cuts. So as you can see, this impacts both students and educators alike. And again, it is hard for me to uh, bring the bad news to you all and seriously, we gotta act on this. One way that we can act on this is on March, on March 16th to Sacramento, which we have done last year and I'm happy to be a part of it and will be a part of it again. This is uh, a message that we need to send out to the governor, that, like what we sang a while back, that we shall not be moved. We will fight for our rights. We will fight for what we believe in. We will fight for our future. Because again, investing on our children, investing on education, means investing on the future and on the world we live in. We can start anywhere in the world, but it will be a great point if we prove to the world that we can promote education and fight for it here in California. On that note, I would like to leave you guys a quote. It is better to invest the money up front on our community's education than to save a few cents now, but having to spend lots more later on. Brian Cruz, um, I'm a member of SEIU 10 to 1. Um, I, I'm a <laughs> classified worker at San Francisco City College. And I'm going to start with a quote. Um, so get this. The $42 billion deficit is a rock upon our chest, and we cannot breathe until we get it off. It doesn't make any sense to talk about education, infrastructure, water, healthcare reform, and all these things when we have this huge budget deficit. Now this is Governor um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, and I think he has his priorities backwards. Um, and I'm here to talk to, to people here today about um, the experience, I guess, of, of City College workers in this. And I think I can use it to, to, um, to expand on some of the um, ideas people have brought up earlier. So what do the cuts mean for city college workers right now? Well, well right now, people may know the city is, um, is, is, is trying to lay off a lot of workers, and, and that may affect people in our campus through the bumps that are happening. Um, but right now on campus, they're telling us, at least, uh, they're telling us right now, there are going to be no, no layoffs until June 30th, which is still only a few months away. But at the same time, we've got a hiring freeze going on. And um, people have to know, I think we have like 835 classified employees at City College. Um, about half of them are full-time employees. And I think the number of vacancies, we're still not sure how many vacancies there are, but I've, I've heard numbers like 20, 40, something like that. And pretty much you know, every day that they don't fill these spots up, that's another day all of us are working harder and longer trying to, um, 
um, you know, fill other people's positions. An example, um, an extreme example I just found out about today was that people may know we have all these new buildings, a new um, huge mission campus and the wellness center down at the ocean campus. The number of custodians we have working in the district is actually less than what it was seven years ago. Um, and I can only expect that problem to accelerate as these cuts go on. And I, I think Ken was very right when he was saying that these cuts are going to be used as an excuse right now to crush the standards um, that our unions have right now and to crush the contracts that we're, that, you know, that we're going to be negotiating. Uh, case in point is um, one of the things we're going to be re reopening on is um, retirement. Um, and right now the district pays for our, you know, our retirement. They contribute like 6% or so, they want us to pay that instead. And you know, that could mean in a few months that's an immediate 6% cut. Um, and you know, there are other things such as colon and the healthcare uh, premiums we're paying that could go up. It's, it was interesting though, we had a meeting today and it's amazing the concept that workers know how to run their work sites better than, than management and the administration there really became apparent to me because people were talking about, well, you know, they're wasting all this money on this, why don't we change that? And one of the things we noticed where they were wasting a lot of money was if we looked at the past seven years, um, both the classified employees and the, um, and the teachers unions, if you looked at how much uh, our wages had increased, it was, it was good, it was like 30% or so. If you look at administration, it was 60% or so. You know, and it became clear to everybody in the room, one of the things we've gotta do is cut the fat. Um, and I think, um, well that was good. So, what have we done in the past um, and what we're gonna do in the future? Ken brought up the, the march that happened in 2005, was it, I think, when we brought 25,000 people to Sacramento to march against Prop 74, 75, and 76. I think March isn't, isn't too late to do something. We need to do, I mean, you know, it's good. I'm glad we're having this protest on February 3rd. We also need to keep it up. Um, and so um, we're gonna be trying to get 15 buses out to Sacramento for the March 16th protest. Um, and one of the things, I think there's gonna be actually a conference the, the day before in Sacramento, March 15th, to get public workers from around the state to talk about statewide strategies for taking on the, the, the cuts, which I think needs to be done. Um, somebody also brought up the stimulus package that's being proposed, and I read in an article that California could get something like $11.2 billion out of this, which is a fourth of what the shortfall would be um, like over the next one and a half years. And um, somebody said it was rhetoric. And I think, it, well, right now it is rhetoric, and that's why it's absolutely important. We go, <laughs> march on the streets, march in Sacramento on March 16th, and we know we need to keep the fight up. Um, and actually May Day is coming around the corner, May 1st. I think if there's a time more than ever to actually reclaim International Workers Day in this country and to actually say, you know, this is, this is a day all working people need to unite and fight, it's actually this year. Um, and, and there's, I think here in, Sacram in, here in Sacramento, here in San Francisco, we need to make sure that that, that march this year can raise all the banners um, you know, of not just immigrant rights, and it should raise a banner of immigrant rights, which it will, but also for all working people. And I, I just like to remind people, I'll, I'll end on this, because we are entering a historic period and we have to realize the shift that's happening in this country. Uh, first of all, politically, over the last eight years, we've had eight years of war, eight years of Bush, we've had 30 years of a new liberal agenda and all this stuff has come crashing down. People have realized privatization, deregulation, war, this isn't working for us, we need something different. And I think we've seen, you know, we've elected our first African-American a president in a country founded on slavery. And now, we need to be able to say, now this economic stimulus package that's being proposed, it's good, but you need to take it a step further. We need something that's gonna work for us. We, you know, $750 billion for corporations and billions of that is going towards bonuses. We actually wanna see a bailout for the workers. I am Russell Kilday Hicks, and I work in the 23 campus California State University system. My union, the California State University Employees Union, um, one of eight in the system, uh, we're also part of the California Employees Association and an SEIU local. Um, we represent about 16,000 of the non-faculty staff, the ones who form the backbone of the system. We do, you know, the cleaning the toilets, the cutting of the grass, 
um, you know, tending the gardens and filing records and looking after student health, running the computers. And we enable the faculty to teach and we enable a university education to transform lives. We've seen the CSU cut by well over half a billion dollars. This is a, a series of really three big cuts um, since you know, the late 90s and, and 2003, there was another round. And then last year, they cut another 100, 212 um, million from, our, from the system. And this year, the threats are almost another 100 million. And you heard someone mention earlier, we're turning away students and um, demand has never been higher. And uh, you know, with the, meanwhile, with the backdrop of you know, the, the CSU Chancellor Reed playing violin, the trustees make deals in the back rooms to make sure that the CSU executives can afford a vacation home or a yacht or you know, however the well-to-do spend to labor's wealth. And then um, the students and their families are paying double the use taxes, um, only they call them fees. And just three years ago, um, you know, the fees have doubled in three years. And each year threatens more increases, another 10% threatened this year. And um, the CSU can't even come close to meeting the demand. And we also um, are losing courses. And uh, you can't get, so, uh, you know, the, the new creed for the CSU apparently is harder to get in and harder to get out. And um, meanwhile, you know, we who run the place take on more students every year with fewer resources. And in old-fashioned labor terms, this would be called factory speed up. And coming on the heels of, you know, so much downsizing already, the effects this year to San Francisco State in particular, where I work, aren't that dramatic. Um, you know, we're losing uh, maybe 130 course sections for the fall. Uh, these are taught mostly by temporary professors. So, you know, a lot of people don't know where they'll be in the fall, and um, a lot of temp employees you just heard in the, in the community college system, same story in the CSU. Um, you know, careers and salaries are stagnating, and um, we're all doing more with less. And then, you know, uh, we, we have entered into what we call the alliance for the CSU, and that's um, with administration and the faculty senates in the state, and the unions and the student leaders. Um, and it stopped the chancellor from making, you know, really brutal cuts this time around. But, you know, they already cut all the low-hanging fruit, so it's easy for them to do that now. Um, I really don't know how much it re will really protect us in the end. And, you know, the, the workers and students and are suffering the effects, you know, basically a starved system. They're slowly, slowly choking us down. And, um, but, you know, for the way I feel is ultimately the ones who are going to suffer is all of California. Every fee hike is, you know, making the door to opportunity a little harder to open. The citizens of California need to understand that cutting funds to the CSU is the very opposite of what needs to be done in hard economic times. And our higher education system, the reality is, it's what made California a leader in the world, you know, that we were for a time. Now we're falling behind in so many ways. And, um, you know, there just seems to be, at one time, a brief time ago, there was plenty of money for, you know, illegal evasions, occupations, financial bailouts, and new prisons. You know, there hasn't been a new CSU since, they, since the 60s, since they started the, the, uh, the higher education pact. And, you know, this is someone's twisted dream of a future, but it needn't be ours. It needn't be labor's. And education is really a riot. And, you know, they keep saying we can't afford this. It's, they put education on the expense side. It needs to be on the investment side of the ledger. It's a real mistake to think of it as an expense that we can cut that's expendable. And um, they also say that, you know, public education is unfair competition to groups like uh, University of Phoenix, you know, so-called for-profit. So we have to also have to redefine what they mean by profit, you know, a free public education is a necessity for our times and for restoring hope in our youth and real profit for all of us instead of society's wealth going just to a few. My name is Isabel Auerbach and I'm a health educator. I work for the city and county and I work for the Department of Public Health which has had all these horrendous cuts that are coming, as you know. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our chapter in Local 21 a little bit about the people who are being laid off and then about the effects on the community. 
We're one of the smaller chapters. Right now we have 31 health educators. We are comprised of assistant health educators who have a BA, health educators like me who have a master's in public health, and just a couple of senior health educators who are really supervising health educators. There's only a couple. We basically have no room for advancement. Of our 31 people right now, eight of us are provisional. That means we have no seniority. We're listed on the seniority list with zeros. In case of layoff, which we're going to have, they have no callback rights, and we can't get the city to give the tests. They give them at the end of the three-year period. So we've got a quarter of our chapter that is just living in great insecurity. We are having eight layoffs of the assistant health educators at the BA level. These are almost all people of color. They're all women. Our chapter is mostly women, and it just happens to be that all the layoffs are, are women. Uh, and of the eight that are being laid off, five of them are provisional. So it's going to hurt them very much in terms of looking for other jobs. They're going to be competing with a lot of other people, and we know a lot of the economy is in the same state, so it's going to be very difficult for them. They're doing excellent work, and as for the effects on the community, the work with teaching people, parents, and providers how to use car seats, how to prevent lead poisoning, nutrition, violence prevention, all that is going to slow down or stop. And when you've got a program that's going, like the car seat program that the community knows, but then it kind of clunks along or stops, it's really hard to get it going. The communities that the health department serves and that these eight people are being laid off serve are mostly the low-income communities, mostly communities of color. We know in virtually every health area in San Francisco, we've got health disparities, that the, the African Americans are generally going to be the ones who suffer the most, Latinos after them. Asians are generally doing pretty good. Uh, so that work, which is so important, that, that keeps people out of the healthcare system, because we mostly don't do healthcare, we do prevention, that, that dirty word <laughs> that keeps being cut. It keeps people out of the emergency room, it keeps people out of the hospital, it keeps people out of the morgue. And a lot of the work we do is really community empowerment, asking the community, what is it that you need? What is the next step that, that you are gonna take? And re really adding to that, that part of the Declaration of Independence that's looking for health and happiness and, and taking that next step towards human actualization. All that uh, is, is going to be gone. With the eight layoffs, our chapter will have 23 members. Ten years ago when I came we had 46, so that's half. This work is very, very needed. You know it's needed. Much more needs to be done. We need to be increasing and instead we're decreasing. Thank you. Uh, I'm here because at Public Health we're very, very angry. And we're trying to get everybody angry because basically the health system is being gutted. Uh, they're doing it very secretly. They're doing it undercover, but it's being gutted. So things like uh, de-skilling. What that means is when you go to the doctor and you think you're talking to a nurse, it's not going to be a nurse. It's going to be a medical assistant who is not licensed, who's going to be giving you medical advice and they shouldn't be. So it's those kind of de-skilling issues that are going to hurt public health a lot. They're cutting behavioral health. That means they're going to have more mentally ill people out on the streets, not getting treated, and that's a problem for all of us. And that, that's what I wanted to talk about. And the, other, the main thing is that we're going to try to put a ballot on the initiative for a sales tax. That's what our union is trying to get uh, City Hall to do. There's going to be a rally tomorrow at 2 o'clock. So we, if, we can get, if we can get as much support for that. One o'clock. The rally's at one o'clock, but the actual talking to the Board of Supervisors, which is probably just as important, that's at two. It's going to start at two o'clock. So we need as many people as possible to come out and give their input about, you know, 
that at San Francisco you passed Prop A that proved you wanted a very good health center, they, and that's a lot of money that they passed so that San Francisco General could be rebuilt, and it's not okay that they gut it from the other end now. And healthy San Francisco is another issue. Uh, it's a system that's being sold, and if they fund it properly, it's gonna be a great system. But I, can, I will tell you now, we know it's not funded properly, and that everybody who should be getting treated with healthy San Francisco is not. I'm Maria Guillen with SEIU 1021, and I actually uh, represent the Human Services Agency chapter uh, along with uh, David Williams. And, um, oh, wait a minute, you're retired now. <laughs> Thanks for your service, David. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, I just want to talk about some of the cuts that are going to be coming down uh, to the city, some of the cuts in service. And I also want to mention that uh, amongst the layoffs that are, uh, that are being proposed for city workers, uh, HSA is taking, I guess, the, the second largest cut. We actually have about 64 layoffs in our department. Uh, two of them are MEA workers, and the rest are SEIU 10 to 1 workers. Um, so we'll be um, uh, trying our best to figure out how we are going to be able to save uh, services and um, the, our, our jobs for our members. But just to give you a glimpse of what, what this means, um, there's one particular unit within Human Services Agency. It's a unit of, of child protective service workers that are specialized. They do work that a lot of us wouldn't be able to do, and that is a sexual exploitation unit where they have to go and protect young children, right, against sexual exploit uh, per perpetrators. And this whole unit is being uh, decimated. Um, and so, you know, we, we try our best to figure out, you know, even though law enforcement says they need to keep all of their, you know, funding and they need to keep all of the police there, you know, in order to, to you know, prosecute or, or to arrest folks, but what happens to the child itself, right? The child itself. How how do they um, get? You know, how do they heal? How do they? Um, how are they treated? Um, uh, and so forth. And so we worry about that. There's another thing. Um, back in '96, when then President Clinton um, put forward welfare reform, one of the things that happened, right, was that seniors or elders that used to be eligible for Social Security uh, Supplemental Income, SSI. Well, um, all of a sudden, these legal permanent residents that were at once eligible, all, be all of a sudden became ineligible, right? And so they didn't have any income. Um, so one of the things that I was really proud of in our department, which I actually work for the Department of Aging and Adult Services, is that we, we you know, um, responded by saying, you know, we need to to provide services to the elderly and, and help them become naturalized, um, help them get citizenship here, right? Because once they're a citizen, then they'll be eligible for, for um, these benefits. And so um, a lot of money was put into this program, and a lot of uh, our seniors did, in fact, become citizens. And, and it was more than just for the, the income. It's, you know, because, again, these are folks that came here and worked, right? They were, they were nannies to people's children. You know, they worked in the restaurants. You know, they were the custodians that we were talking about earlier. They, these are people that came and, and, and actually worked and they're here legally and they were being denied these services. Well, we did all that, but now, guess what? Now because there's money is tight, they're going to try to pull back that money, right? So, and there's still people that need to have, um, uh, to become naturalized. Uh, so those are a couple of the, of the services, but um, of course, you know, we all know that We've worked so hard, especially in San Francisco, to make sure that IHSS workers, right, um, that they, you know, they do such important work, you know, and um, they keep people in their homes, you know, we keep them out of institutions. Um, they don't make a lot of money, but in San Francisco, we've been able to at least raise the, 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 the wages for them and also try to get some other benefits as well. Well, that's threatened, right? The, the, the governor on, in the state budget threatens all of that, as well as other important services like Medi-Cal and so forth. So those are all things that, you know, they're going to have ripple effects. Um, you know, we need to save that, you know, um, um, these, you know, human services for, for folks. Um, because again, as, as, as the younger folks were saying earlier, right, if you don't put the money in here, you know, you're going to put it at the, end, at the back end, which is 
really um, detrimental to all of us. Connie Ford from Office Employees Local 3, I will be very quick too. I'm sort of representing the bottom of the bottom. As the lowest paid workers of the city in community-based nonprofits, we represent the workers who work at the homeless shelters, the support services, the domestic violence houses, the alcohol and drug rehab centers, all of those case management for homeless people, employment specialists, all of those people who really help keep people off the streets and help people change their lives. These are the people who are make 12, 13, 15, at the most $18 an hour. Because of, of unionization and hard work amongst all of them, they now, the, the workers in our union, have health benefits and have all of the kinds of things you enjoy. That's, thank you. That's, that's totally, totally being cut. Okay, there's cuts happening right now on February the 20th. That's when the first set of cuts happen. The next round of cuts is May the 1st. And then the following round of cuts is the new budget where they're saying it's $575 million short starting July 1. And who gets hurt? We all get hurt. The students get hurt. The teachers get hurt. The homeless get hurt. The low-wage workers get hurt. It's time to really sit back and think about what's going on and what's going to happen to our city and the people in the state when all of those services that all of us have worked so hard to build, to grow, to nurture, to give to people so that they can help with their lives and change their lives when those are no longer being gone. Just let me give you one example. In this city, the mayor thinks that the homeless population is in trouble. He has devised this program called uh, Housing First. What does that mean? That means he's going to put folks in the house and eliminate case management, eliminate public health, eliminate employment specialists, and eliminate drug and alcohol support, eliminate domestic, domestic violence support. So those folks are going to be in those rooms by themselves with no support. And what's going to happen? They're going to end up back on the streets. We're all going to be seeing lots and lots and lots more of the vets who are homeless, the mentally ill who are homeless, out there because the city and the state, $40 billion deficit of the state, are saying that we cannot afford to help those most vulnerable. So when we talk about this whole picture, and I want, I, we need to think of everybody, but we need to think a lot about those who will be hurt the most, and those are at the lowest bottom of the barrel. Bobby Lopez, nonprofit sector. I see I'll make it short because I know it's been a long night. Um, I think you're hearing from a lot of folks from SEIU because we're getting you know, when people say the cuts are coming, no, the cuts are here. Our union's being disproportionately affected by it. Hundreds of people laid off at General Hospital. We're looking at hundreds of people in the nonprofit sector. And when we talk about that, we're not just talking about the workers, we're also talking about the clients and the folks that live and survive based on these services. Um, I just want to throw a couple of numbers out there just to give us people a little bit of a sense of what we're dealing with. We've been asked to do a 5% cut in the de Department of Public Health. 5% cut across the board. We've already been told that for the fiscal year, it's another 12.5% cut and another potential 12.5% contingent cut. That means 30% of our public health cut in San Francisco. That's very serious because we're talking about folks that depend on substance abuse treatment, HIV, uh, mental health is being gutted. Um, and I think Brenda laid it out really perfectly. The hospitals are being gutted, and all the acute services, all the support services that are community-based, nonprofit-based, those are all being gutted as well. And I wanted to just put a human face on this in that, and just mention two programs that we know that we work with that are being gutted. Um, I work with immigrants, Latino immigrants in the Tenderloin, and we refer people all the time to homeless prenatal. I think a lot of folks know homeless prenatal. They're looking at a 10% cut of their budget. Uh, and that's horrible because they've doubled in the number of people that they've seen just this past month because of the economy, and we've doubled in the number of clients we've seen because our families are being laid off in the restaurant industry. They can't afford diapers, they can't afford to pay their rent, and their go-to safety net programs like homeless prenatal, they won't be able to do that anymore. The um, AIDS emergency fund where I've referred folks uh, for vouchers when they have bed bugs, or I've referred folks when they need to, they can't pay the rent, they're going to be cutting 1,000 people services uh, for the AIDS emergency fund. We're actually also very much getting um, HIV services, which is really problem. We're, we're being crippled, and we're asking for support. I'm going to just be brief on this. As Brenda said, tomorrow, 1 o'clock, there's going to be a very small press conference, and we mean short. Um, and we really want folks to come to and give public, uh, public testimony at 2 o'clock in the chambers at City Hall. 
Um, there is some legislation we're looking at, negative supplemental. It's very different than initially started. I just barely looked at it today, and I think very few people have actually fully seen it. But one thing that I feel is very pro-labor about it is that we're not chopping from the bottom, we're not taking away our safety net services, we're asking the city to really evaluate the management positions that they've hired since 2003, irresponsibly paying people $200,000 and $300,000 when we can't afford it. My name is Gabe Weiss and I work with SEIU Local 1000. We represent state workers, so people that give unemployment benefits at EDD, DMV workers, Coastal Commission, um, and I think since the summer, roughly, state workers have been under attack, whether it was the 10,000 state workers who lost their job this summer that were seasonal or temporary, to uh, state workers being told that they were going to get paid minimum wage. Um, right now, we're being threatened with furloughs, which represent about a 10% cut in people's uh, wages when state workers in general tend to make about 25 percent compared to other um, agencies, the county and the city. Uh, they're also being told that they're going to be receiving IOUs perhaps as early as um, February and March for their work. So when they're able to pay their mortgages, it'll be with an IOU, which doesn't work very well. Um, what we have done so far, we've really been trying to focus on the services we provide and um, the people that are affected by those services. We've been holding rallies, um, both at the state capitol and here at the state building in San Francisco and in Oakland. We've had commercials that are running that talk about some of the state services um, that we provide. Um, we've lobbied both at the district level, at the capitol, uh, written lots of letters, made a lot of calls. I think one unique approach that we took was having Republican members actually writing letters and making calls to the Republican legislators, because they kind of speak their language. I don't speak it, I don't know at all how to talk to Republicans, but in general our members that are Republicans do do a little bit better job at that. Um, that being said, I don't think you've seen a lot of movement out of Republicans, so whether or not you call it effective, I think is, um, I would say it hasn't been that effective. I do think it is an interesting approach. What we are trying to do now in this last about six weeks has been trying to focus on the community groups that Republicans might actually listen to. When it comes to labor unions, they pretty much just close their ears. When it involves um, church groups in, in their community, if it involves um, people that work on public safety, they seem to be opening their ears a little bit. So instead of always saying, what about us, what about us, I think trying to reach out and say, what about the people that are going to be affected by our services, I think it's a little bit, um, a little bit better approach than just for us state workers just complaining about how hard we've been cut. Um, so that's a little bit of kind of what we've been doing. Um, Bob mentioned that we do need to be kind of focusing on Republicans. That being said, putting some pressure on Democrats to actually have a, a backbone be coming out and talking about all the services and all the people that are going to be affected, I think would be incredibly beneficial. Uh, for the most part, I've heard a lot of silence out of out of both sides of the um, legislature. Um, it was mentioned earlier about who to target. He, Bob couldn't say it, so I think I'm allowed to. Um, <laughs> Abel Maldonado, he is a state senator down on the Central Coast. He's voted for a budget before. Hate to call him moderate, but in, in these times, in these gerrymandered districts, he's about as moderate as we get. Um, Jeff Denham, who has parts of Fresno and parts um, down in like Salinas, he's pseudo uh, moderate also. And then down, um, down a little bit south of that in like San Luis Obispo is uh, assembly member Sam Blakesley. And he's supported a, a few um, pieces of legislation that we've done. So there's there's a chance that he would also come and, 
actually support some kind of revenue increases. Um, we're, we're working hard. We're going to be lobbying tomorrow all around the state with congressmen about the stimulus package. The vote's actually happening Wednesday. So a call tomorrow to your congressman, I think, is a, is a good uh, first, first step. And then in the next week or two, really kind of putting pressure on Dianne Feinstein to make sure that money comes in to California. We haven't heard any question about accountability. There hasn't been any real challenge to the administrators starting at the top for making the decisions they've made, kowtowing to Bush and these people for the last 30 years and whatever to create this problem. In 1929, when the government, when the capitalism system crashed, we saw an apathetic government do nothing until the people of this country demanded a plan, put into office someone who had a plan. So I propose to all of you in all of these encounters we have, in all of your unions, in the unions I'm in, we always challenge people who are gonna cut our wages and cut our positions what are you cutting out of your pocket? Are you getting a check? Are you, are you taking a one-for-one -one cut out of your staff if you're taking away our people's jobs? Is Schwarzenegger getting a paycheck right now and he's doing all this? No, and more than anything, the question is, what is the plan? You're the leaders, the elected leaders of our state. What is the plan that you propose to get us out of this? Uh, Toomey was talking about in the short term, we have to pressure the moderates, quote unquote, to cut a compromise in the current budget so that social services and public schools don't get slaughtered. But nothing great is going to come out of this round of budget negotiations. The reason why UESF and UTLA and other large urban locals fought it on the floor of the CTA State Council against the 1% sales tax is because for public schools is that that's not going to solve anything. So what we need to do, even if we lose the first time, is to start the long-term fight to first of all get rid of the two-thirds requirement to get a budget. To <laughs> the majority of people in, Sa in California are prisoners to the tyranny of a minority who don't have the interest of working people in the urban areas at heart. So that's one thing. And the second thing, we're not going to get a plan from those folks in Sacramento, except the most progressive legislators. So we got to go to the ballot, not only to end the two-thirds requirement in Sacramento, but to put progressive taxation right back on. on the agenda. Right on. That's the plan. That's what UESF's for. That's what the progressive <laughs> unions and CT locals and CTA and CFT are for. And we all have to join together and fight for it. And that's why my union, my statewide affiliate, is so wrong to go ahead with a 1% sale tax, only for K through 12, as bad as we need it. It's the wrong solution, and we have to join together and get initiatives on the ballot. If a progressive state legislators can't do it, then we got to do it. Right. One of the things, the problem, the crisis, we're going into a depression. Even President Obama said there's a national economic emergency. Okay, do, do people know what that means? Everything's collapsing. In California, it means that property values are collapsing. Public services are financed by property taxes in California. Under Proposition 13, you know, they cut funding for public services when the property value goes down. So we're going to see 40, 50 percent cut in, uh, in funding for public services. That's a radical situation. There has to be a ballot initiative uh, immediately to get rid of the commercial exemption on Prop 13. So they tax big corporations at a fair rate. That's a basic thing. The problem is, I think that the crisis that the labor movement is in is, you know, during people say about WPA, WPA this, WPA that. We want a WPA. Well, the WPA didn't come because Roosevelt was nice. It didn't come because he was nice. It came because workers had general strikes. Workers were occupying factories. That's why it came, because the capital said, uh-oh, there's going to be a revolution. People are taking over everything. People are protesting. We don't have that right now. Everybody's waiting for Obama to make it happen. Obama is not going to save us. The idea that somebody else is going to save us, let's be clear, in California, the Democrats are working on massive budget cuts with Schwarzenegger. Right now. And we have to, we have, to have mass action in Sacramento of hundreds of 
thousands of people. We have to have the entire labor movement say enough is enough. And it's not just public workers. Look at the construction workers. There have been thousands and thousands of construction workers who have been thrown out of work. The unions, unfortunately, where are they? Where are the building trades protesting these cutbacks? I think we have to have a, a plan, a strategy that calls for the mobilization of the labor movement. To, to make that an issue that is, 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 shuts things down and says, look, we, we are not going to operate unless people can survive. And we can't survive in this, in this situation of a mass depression under the present structural problems that we face. There has to be structural changes. And I think that the waiting, I mean, it's like waiting for the legislature. You know, what uh, Roosevelt did, what the legislature is, if you have 500,000 people in Sacramento saying you've got to change the structure of how California is organized, to take care of people, then they'll say, oh, we've got to do something. Just waiting, lobbying is not going to do it. And that, I think that approach is a dead end. The other just did a, a study, a poll, the other, about a month ago, to say what would people vote for, all of that kind of thing about this revenue crisis. And the most shocking thing, the most shocking thing to many of us in this poll was that the majority of people in San Francisco don't, as of the end of this year, a couple of weeks ago, don't understand that San Francisco is in a crisis. They understand the federal government is, they understand the state is, but they don't think it's here because those folks aren't educated, those folks aren't reading, those folks don't know. So one of the things, and I absolutely agree with everybody, that what we have to do is we have to start being on the streets, we have to be making our voices heard, we have to push that way. But the first thing we have to do before we do that, somehow these stories that we all told about our members and our children and our services that are being denied have to be put out to the public so the public can wake up, not just us in the room, but the public can wake up and really feel this loud and strong and in their bones. And once we start educating and moving people that way, then we do the kinds of things that other people are saying. Then we bring people in the streets. Then we do the marches. Then we do the demonstrations. My comment has to do with something that you just been saying, Tim, a little while ago, and giving a, a paying credence to the rank and file presenters, right, and saying that you know we need to hear from the rank and file. We're the ones that are going through this, whatever, right? Well, I want to challenge you, Brother Paulson, to also be mindful that when you go to meet in the mayor's office or wherever, right, that rank and file leaders need to be there too, yeah. okay? I know of a particular incident that just recently happened and I was asked to make this message, to send this message, where, you know, um, you only took one of the staff members from SAU 1021 when in fact we had specifically said we wanted one of our, our rank and file leaders to also attend. It's not enough. You know, you have, rank, you have rank and file leaders as well as staff leaders. So I just want to really impress upon you and really challenge you, brother. Uh, I know that you do a lot um, in this regard and I really thank you for all of that. But again, I think that that's uh, an important um, uh, aspect to remember. I hear that. Picture of visions for change. But what's the most important specific action that I as an individual can take to affect that change? So I think the organizing and the rallies, those are all very important education step by step within our locals, among our communities and our families. That's all a good thing. But let's not forget that the most powerful weapon that we have among working people and the working class is the general strike. Republic windows and doors struck until they got what they wanted. In the freezing cold, Boeing machinists struck for over 50 days in Seattle, Washington in the fall of 2008. So we have to think about what can we do to make everything stop until our demands as workers are met. So we need to think, they did it in the 30s, sit down strike, our brothers and sisters did it. I don't see why we can't do that again, but we have to organize to do that. So let's not forget that we workers can make things happen and change. And you know, I think the problems are just terrible. Every time you open up the paper or listen to the TV news, and I want to share this. Unionists are also citizens, and we need to make the same demands as citizens that we make on our union leadership. The best unions are always led by rank and file where the leaders walk with us. And this, we need to make sure that happens at the national level. We need to demand that the government serve the common good our tax revenues and our public services should serve the common good. 
we need to make demands. I agree with what Steve said, but I also believe that, that the Obama administration will be receptive to a massive, strong, unified voice to do the best for the, to serve the common good. And to do so, we need to, we need to have progressive forms of taxation or revenue uh, generating. However, we also need to make sure we stop the two wars. We're spending so much money killing people when we're starving public services, human services. We also need to reform health care. And we talk a lot about stopping the wars, but we also need to bring home the troops that are from Turkey to Korea for, that give us no strategic military advantage. This is, this is Pentagon thinking from the Second World War. We need, to bring, we need to bring those troops home. We need to stop the investment of the billions of dollars in the technology of death that kills civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, many other parts of the world. When we do those things, I think now we, we've reached a point where the level of desperation will make people much more receptive to changes that they would never have considered before. It's a disaster, a time of disaster, but a time of great opportunity, and we have only ourselves to blame if we don't change things. Thank you. Right